Dr. Thomas Gerst, um, thank you so much for joining this conversation. It's a real privilege to, to talk to you. Uh, let's start with our short introductions. Uh, I'm Alexandra Marila. I'm a strategist at Co-Founders. Uh, we're a Helsinki-based consultancy and we help companies develop their brand and culture. My role is to find the sweet spot, so to say, uh, between arts and business, to explore the role of arts within business contexts and also how art as a method could help uh, businesses solve challenges uh, in the future. So needless to say, I'm extremely curious and excited to talk to you, uh, given your role as a head of cultural engagement at the BMW Group. Um, and also your whole background in humanities. Uh, you're a published author, uh, you write on art, literature, and business. You've been teaching at universities, including the Academy of Arts in Munich and the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. You came into the business world from the art world. Can you tell me a little bit about your journey and uh, how this shift happened? I mean, I have two sons, they're 14 and 16, and I tell them, you know, no matter what it is that you might be interested in in the future, all I want to see is some passion and I'm going to be of support. Um, and and, I, and I, if you have a job where, you know, your personal passions overlap with what it is that you do 70%, it's like you hit the jackpot, seriously. So for me, it was clear very early, not because I was a lonely kid, you know, I, I would consider myself to have been a social uh, child with with friends and and cherishing friendships and all of that. I, I nevertheless, you know, spend a lot of time reading and feeling really passionate about the arts because my parents were not not that they were not interested, but they were really trying to make a living and and working hard. So and they didn't study. Um, so so they they didn't really you know cultivate an interest in art or literature. So my younger brother always said this was my field. You know that I had for myself, and I have to kind of give thanks to my godmother about this, but it was always clear for me that I would, that I could only survive within the coordinates of the arts. So, you know, the one job that BMW has to offer in this regard, I was happy to take on um, uh, um, and, and then stick with it. Usually if you make a career within a big business like the BMW Group, you change your job every three years, you know, to climb up the corporate ladder, which it makes complete sense because people don't want you to be just in one job and one position only because they also feel like if you have the same job for 10 years, you kind of run out of passion and curiosity. Two character traits, I think, that are essential to what it is that anyone should be doing because life is not a rehearsal. You know, you live your life, you live it now, you know, and, and, um, and I would always say that to me, it's the, the approach is always the as well as and not the either or. So I was always interested in art as well as literature. You know, I was, I, I now have a corporate job, but I still write books. It's not that these things all have to be mutually exclusive. You know, as Walt Whitman said, I am large, I contain multitudes. You know, Alexandra, I know that there's, I don't know, 10, 12, we don't know each other, but 12 Alexandras within you, you know, fighting, <laughs> Not against each other, but you know, it's like, okay, who's going to be in charge on Tuesday, but who's going to be in charge on Wednesday. And so, and I think you cannot leave your passions behind like tectonic plates shifting away from you because at one point you cannot get them back. You know, when you think, oh, I'm going to go delve now into that job and then pursue my, my passion as an architect at the age of 60, that's not going to happen. You know, so cultivate your passions, stick with your passions. It's easy for me to say now because I am officially part of that gravy train, you know, to have one of these amazing jobs within the cultural fields. I very much am aware of my privilege. Um, uh, I also fought hard for that and, and I'm happy that this pays off. I know it doesn't pay off uh, for everybody, but I would always, always, always say, look, um, as Kafka said, you know, that the, the, you, you, you create your own path through the jungle. There's nobody who went this path before. You know, and my life is not a glorious life. You know, I have a corporate job as a, as a middle manager, but at the same time, it's, it's what I want and it's what I can. And so um, I, it was never clear cut. You know, when you look back on your life, I think Sartre said once a life, make, a life doesn't make sense while you live it, but when you look back on it, it sort of does because then you can connect the dots. So me being passionate about the arts was, I was writing, you know, criticism for um, for the school newspaper that I founded, and then um, I went on to write as a cultural correspondent when I got a scholarship to study at NYU, New York University in New York. When you were in New York in your early twenties, you want to stay there, so I did for almost a decade. 
and I delved into jobs. My first job was at a gallery on the Upper East Side. So I think it's great to see this job, you know, the culture for many facets. I know how a gallery works from within. You know, I've worked in museums. I've done my journalistic experiences. So um, all of that, you know, made me then apply uh, from the United States to many full jobs within Germany. And uh, it just so happened that at BMW, the woman that was, uh, uh, had my position was basically leaving. So yes, there's always, right. always, always luck involved, mm -hmm. but you must try. And there's nobody who can try for you, you know? It's, I think, I think um, it's important that you're the one pushing for yourself because no one else does it or should do it for you. You know, it's not privilege, but really earning your privilege and, and, and making, your, making your voice heard. So uh, it was a natural procession. And, and just to finish that thought at the, at the very beginning, when I, when, I, um, when I started at BMW, I always thought I had to justify myself you know, in front of my journalistic friends, in front of my art, histori art historical friends, you know, from university. I also had founded a literature box with loose sheets of paper that we called uh, um, um, the outside of the element and it was called the nonprofit art movement. So it was all against any corporate engagement and involvement in the arts. So I always felt, damn it, I now switch to the dark side, you know, like, like in some Star Wars trilogy. <laughs> but um, I then realized how much I can do you know, how much I can do within the company, earn my trust, do meaningful things that can resonate, um, you know, instead of just, you know, being in charge of one museum and being able to do things locally, which is all good and great, you know, with a corporate company involved with 120,000 employees the world over, you can really go and look into what can be done in Shanghai, what you can, what you might be able to do in Buenos Aires, or in Helsinki for that matter. So, um, so this is um, a big opportunity and I still, I still go to BMW every day as if it were a candy shop. Yeah, I can imagine given your work. So um, it, it's not difficult to imagine. Did it, I mean, obviously when you started there, it opened up to a lot of new possibilities, like you said, different possibilities than uh, you would have had if you would have stayed in a museum. Did it shift your mindset or your way of seeing things uh, going to the business world? And how? Yeah, because sometimes I wish I had studied at least one semester of business or whatever that's called, you know, because I'm surrounded by those that are very good in that field. And I'm, you know, I'm that exotic bird, uh, you know, that is part of the BMW group. But I think that, you know, I mean, I've been now with them for, for 17 years. So I think there's mutual respect for each other. And yes, I have to, you know, writing manifestos against corporate influence in the arts yeah. kind of positions you perfectly for the job that I'm doing now, because I, I very much understand the other side. And I very much have the sensibilities, the knowledge, the network, the know-how to, to, to be able to understand uh, uh, the other side. And I don't really want to speak of sides here because I do think that business and arts have a lot to learn from each other. Looking at, the, like art institutions should look from each other, from the, should look at themselves from the outside. They should look at, you know, what does define me? What sets me apart from others? What is my a unique selling point or my USP? What is, how can I survive in this attention competition, even within the arts? So all of those vocabulary might sound far off from artistic institutions, but at the same time, it's great to go through these moves and really look at this strategically and structurally. So there's a lot to learn from each other. And I would say that companies for me were evil, you know what I mean? Evil entities. Okay, you know, so you were at that extreme. Like, like these, like these stone material like not to be penetrated but then you know it boils down into hundreds and dozens of people M many of most of them you respect many of them you like and um and so so it, it it it's at the end of the day of course it's easy to have your stereotypes but it's it's harder to have them break down within you and try to make sense of it so now i'm actually i see beauty in a company like the bmw group that has been around for a hundred years, for over a hundred years, the shelf life of successful companies is no more than 50 years usually, you know, and, and it's a company that sustains 120,000 employees and their families. Um, it's, it's, this is also, there's, there's also beauty in the business case and not only in the art. So I'm, I'm actually very happy uh, to, to see, to be able to navigate between those two sides. And also me coming from art and literature, um, I was then also, you know, put in charge of 
uh, corporations when it comes to architecture, when it comes to design, when it comes to opera. So I cannot even read notes, you know what I mean, when it comes to new music. So all of a sudden, even that field culture was opening up to me in yeah. a way that I would never have that had open up to me um, because I didn't study these subjects. But now all of a sudden, I had to have conversations with opera directors. Do you know how... <laughs> <laughs> how opera directors are sometimes, you know, they, they are sun kings, you know, in their own universe. So, which I kind of like, it's fine, yeah. but, um, but it's, a, it's always a challenge. And, um, and, and, and it's, all, I, I think I love to play all this. I could not play the piano in real, but I, I feel like I'm playing the right tunes, you know, by making these worlds come together in a meaningful way and not just yeah. throwing money, taking it and do whatever it is that you want to do anyways. Yeah, definitely. I I think it's it's so interesting to open up all of these worlds and then make these combinations. So I was curious from all of the programs because well, you have uh, BMW Art Cars, the Art Journeys, which are artistic, uh, like kind of artist um, exploration, so to say, and then, uh, collaborations with Tate Modern and the Guggenheim with, uh, art fairs like Freeze and Art Basel. So from all of these, um, initiatives, and then, like you said, with music, um, as well, um, from all of these partnerships and collaborations, what is something that to you was most meaningful? Of course, knowing they all are, but, but what, what did you find most rewarding? But I think first is thinking strategically. I think that you know BMW is, a, is 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 the core business is the manufacture of great technologically advanced cars and creating the desire for people to buy it. It's about the image and the reputation that you also kind of um, uh, uh, um, pay tribute to in your cultural engagement. It's never removed from your core business. We're not there for philanthropy or altruism or or any such thing. It has to do with with the brand and the visibility of the brand without being too in your face. So I think just to make the decision that yes, you are a luxury manufacturer, a premium car manufacturer, doesn't mean that your cultural engagement only caters to the very few that are able to buy a car. Who's able to buy a car for 100,000 euros? Please. I mean, it's not that many people, but who's, who's, who's entitled to enjoy an opera for free instead of paying 200 euros for the front seat or the back seat even? So it's, 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 that's where corporate citizenship comes in. That's where your, that's where your, 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 your responsibility comes in. That's where it's about your attitude. It's about how do you see yourself as a brand? Um, it's a culture brand, BMW. It is, we want to give something back to the society that we do successful business in. And I really mean that. And this is really happening. If we are doing uh, many operas for all on Trafalgar Square in London, now, of course, all not happening. Yeah because we believe in these public concerts because we want to make culture, high culture, accessible um, and, 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 and affordable. This is what, 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 you know, that's not natural for a premium manufacturer, but at the same time, that's what we can do. And that's what we want to do. So every smiling face among those 40,000 people listening to Daniel Barenboim direct on Bebeplatz in Berlin or Sir Simon Metal on Trafalgar Square or, 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 or the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow, um, then I roam the aisles and I look at people smiling and I think that's all the reward that I need. And that's all the, the heart opening um, experience that I need to see other people happy and delve into that and take on that offer um, from BMW. Um, uh, otherwise that would not have been possible. Um, but the, it's these little things. You, know, it's, it's, uh, you mentioned the BMW art cars and the BMW art journey, where it's also not about being about the bling bling, but about the meaningful. It's not about the champagne only and the lounges, but it is about making a difference ideally and making something that lasts and something that has an impact on the artists and on the viewer. While artists need money, don't get me wrong, Alexandra, they do. Um, um, no. <laughs> we don't wanna just throw an award at, 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 at artists. It's, it's, it's almost obscene, yeah? I mean, not that they don't need the money, but the thing is, can we do something better? So we come up with the BMW art journey every single artist wants to go on a journey that they have in their heads. Even Alexandra Marina, Marila wants to go on some journey that you have in your head. And, and, and you can't because either you don't have the funding or you don't have the time. And we want to try to provide both 
and make this happen for artists to take their studio on the road. Um, and it's so much more rewarding for the artist, for the art that comes out of it, for us. People don't need to drive around in, an, in, a, in a BMW. They don't need to have a driver's license. You know, if they are um, eligible for the BMW Art Journey, which we cooperate on with Art Basel. So um, I'm very proud of these, of these um, cooperations. And sometimes, yes, the most fulfilling thing, if you ask me, was to really follow the first, one of the most fulfilling things was to work with uh, Samson Young, the first recipient of the Art Award, who was researching old bells of church steeples around the world, and uh, to, to travel with him for three days in, in southern France to look at old, uh, um, to look at old bells in, in ancient churches, remote churches where priests came along with, with keys that were that big, you know, to let us up the ladders and, and, you know, that hadn't been climbed for 200 years was amazing. And that is, for me, it's, it's, it's again, it's a huge privilege to also work close with artists like Jeff Koons, Olaf or Eliasson. I mean, these are all bright people. Um, and, 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 and so th that's the greatest thing actually to to, to work side by side sometimes for a year or two uh, with those artists. Chao Fei, amazing um, um, artist from China who created the BMW um, art car number 18, or John Baldessari who just passed, passed away earlier this year. I could go on, I don't want to bore you, but it's very rewarding, yes. Yeah, you're definitely not boring me. <laughs> and uh, I was curious about, um, so you touched upon working side by side with artists and this is very giving and I, I relate to it a lot, having uh, interviewed a lot of artists and worked closely on some projects with artists and, and it's indeed so meaningful and um, there's a depth to it that, that's hard to replace. Um, in your view, what do you think business leaders have to learn from artists? Because it's often the other way around, the kind of um, how to develop art, artist brand that can be learned from businesses but but the other way around how do you see it i think that the, i think that it's about it's a, you know there's a, a whole thing about talking the talk and walking the walk and i think that uh, that that um that knowledge leads to no that action leads to knowledge and not knowledge to action what i'm saying is that even you know within cultural relationships between art and companies you always talk about the great dialogue between artists and companies but as you said yourself alexandra it's mostly Oh yeah, you know, uh, uh, artists should learn a little bit from the business side of things. But what do we really um, uh, benefit from? And um, and so there's a lot of talking the talk, but not walking the walk. And I, with an incredible team, also always try to make sure that something is being given back to the company. That the whole cultural engagement of the BMW Group started actually with employees. So we have these initiatives that. Uh, you know, that, that if you can find on the intranet, of course, that um, um, all of our colleagues are being informed about what it is that we do in culture. You know, this theater that we, uh, that we um, uh, um, collaborate with, or this opera, and yes, there are certain tickets that they can get all, in terms of compliance, everything is okay, but, um, um, but, but that they can delve into. It's like an offer, you know, we have a monthly offer for a book that they can read um, by an author. Um, so it's, it's not to, never to leave your, your, the employees behind because it's also for them and, and they're, you know, broadening their brain. It's also about when basically the art car with Olafur Eliasson came into being. Um, Olafur Eliasson created a book that was an integral part of his BMW art car where he um, interviewed sociologists, uh, psychologists, philosophers, engineers about the future of the car, about the future of mobility rather. In back in 2007, 2008. And, um, and this was great because our chief designer, Adrian van Hoydonk, turned this book into mandatory reading for all of his 400 BMW designers. Yeah. So yeah, there are things going back into the company. Every yeah. time that there's an artist from France or even from China who want to take pictures of the plant, and you know, sometimes the plants are off limits because secret projects are going on and employees don't necessarily want to be filmed or recorded if a photographer comes in. But that's where the dialogue starts. Mm -hmm. And we always want to open up everything that we can to let artists in because then these artists are talking to our employees and, and they put their heads together. And, and this is on both sides a rewarding experience. We don't just try to pay lip service 
to that. But with those initiatives that are solely for our employees, we really try to make sure that, you, you know, it also creates meaning for us. If we create something extra for our employees, if they see this as a service from their colleagues, to colleagues, delving into literature, you know, you, Alexander, you've, you've seen the beauty of the arts, you know what this does to us. And so why not try to open this up to others? I truly believe, and that is part of what was so interesting to me for that in the job, you know, how can you open these things up, high culture, opera, you know, classical music, jazz even, how can you make, how can you make that accessible for, for a broader audience without watering down the complexity of the beauty of what we are delving into? Yeah. yeah, but at the same time, it's accessible on, on so many different, from so many different angles. I'm curious a bit about the um, internal engagement. Actually, I'm curious a lot about it because also what we do here is look into company culture and how art affects people. And I, I think it's also about the just purely a human level beyond the, your professional, because when you go to work, you're you're a whole human being, not only the role that you inhabit in, in that profession. So can you give me a little bit more insight into some, what kind of shifts in the company culture you have experienced because of, of these art um, programs or cultural programs? Well, if you, I think if you, you know, it's, 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 if, if you create platforms, even within the company, let's say you have, Let's say you have the big plant in Munich, you know, which is over 100 years old. We're, we're in, the, in the most expensive, we're in the middle of the most expensive city in Germany. You know, 250,000 cars are being produced with a business case, you know, behind all of this. Uh, I mean, it's in the north of Munich somewhat, but still now it's pretty much, you know, encircled by the city. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, um, whole walls are dedicated to, um, uh, to the possibility of colleagues showing arts, their artwork there, you know. I don't know, one out of 20 colleagues that I meet for lunch is probably writing poetry in secret <laughs> or, yeah. or, paint, or painting, you know what I mean? And these yeah. paintings, they need to be shown, you know, take it on the next level, have other people talk about it. So this is something, these are things that have been going on for decades. We don't advertise them, you know, we don't run press releases about them, but it's just, it's just you know, if you want to show your art, your employer gives you the possibility to do so. Um, and, um, and also, you know, just during the Corona crisis, I, I, I started reading a podcast, which is called, we call it those whole internal initiatives we call cultural, mo, culture mobile. Wow, um, yeah, I saw and, it. It's one. I mean, the, the writers had to be dead already for 70 years. So that is kind of tough uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, because the, of copyright reasons. But I still, you know, it, it was great to unearth amazing nuggets by, you know, Boccaccio, by Edgar Allan Poe, by Kate Chopin. Um, and, and by other, by Dorothy Parker, by amazing writers from around the world, and just read them as a service to um, employees who are stuck at home, you know, who work from home, and and maybe they just don't always want to play video games or watch television, but maybe they want to listen to a podcast from great writers around the world, and this is something that we feel um, that we feel essential about, and it's also I think it also kind of gives us a justification to do what it is that we're doing. So I would say. You know, authenticity is something that you cannot claim for yourself, but that others have to basically tell you that you are, because the moment you claim it for yourself, it's a lie, right? Um, to you, I cannot say I'm authentic, um, Alexandra. You might think I come across authentic, and you can say that to me. But um, so, but I, I, with the feedback that we are getting from within the company, because we, I don't want to be that exotic person only, but I want to create some meaning, and I want to open up uh, to the colleagues. So I think there is a culture of that. And, and, and I think that makes it all the more worthwhile because BMW as such is a culture brand and we position it in such a way that we don't just make this up as a smoke screen, um, but uh, that we actually live that as well, walking the walk in that regard. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You often make also a distinction between a partnership and sponsorship because I think we've seen quite a lot of brands uh, take on art um, to, to uplift uh, their brand value or to have some kind of side added value to, to the brand. But um, this distinction between a real partnership and a sponsorship is, is important. It's, it's about 
trust, right? And, and how you, yeah, walk through the journey together. Can you um, tell me a little bit more about um, how you see this, the ethics around it and what brands and companies should really pay attention to in when collaborating with artists? I think it's great you mentioned you mentioned trust for sure. I always think that cultural institutions or artists they should not uh, uh, um, uh, leave their criticality behind or their or their thoughts that concern them when working with companies. Um, they should bring that to the table. It's really about being open and being transparent. And when I say partnerships, look, we've all been in partnerships, and we're old enough. Maybe even you are old enough, Alexander, to have been in partnerships that didn't quite work out. You know, we've all been there. You know, we've been hurt, and we have hurt. What I'm saying is. I mentioned partnerships because you go through some shit, if you allow me, and it, but you go through it together and you stand your ground and you don't let yourself get divided by, you know, by anybody who wants to tear you apart if you really feel that this should continue. Otherwise, you let it go. But it's not a sponsorship, as you said exactly. It's like it's a transaction. It's a monetary transaction. Again, every cultural institution, every opera, they want some money for their opera production, for their exhibition. It's completely legitimate of curators, museum directors, etc., to ask for money. But you don't only want to be the cash cow. We never want to interfere with the content. We believe in the creative freedom of artists. But that should be clear from the very beginning. What do we want from each other? You know, and, and put the cards on the table because otherwise you're up for disappointment. You know, um, um, uh, uh, um, so, so this is, it's crucial every step of the way. Sometimes we talk about relationships or um, uh, partnerships for three years behind closed doors before something comes into being, or it doesn't. You know, with the Guggenheim, for example, it was two years of discussions, um, what we can do together. Um, and also we've been around in culture for 50 years. So, we have a big network worldwide because we operate on a global scale. We have great know-how. So if you are our partner and you're curious, which I think you should be, if you value us um, and not just look at us as a cash cow, you know, that gives money, which is always part of it, of course, it's always money going, you know, from the company to the, to the, to the artistic institution or to the artist, but it is a, it is an interaction and not a, just monetary transaction. So while we don't mess with content, um, we can create something together. We get to choose who we work with to begin with, and we can maybe create a great format together. I'm not telling anybody to invite or disinvite this or that orchestra. That is content. That is, you know, we never mess with the curatorial integrity of those that we work with. So you always have to also see from the side of the artist, from the cultural institution, does that really work? Is that a match? And on the side of the of the of the and, and, and on the side of the um, company, you ha just have to have a strategy in place. Mm -hmm. I get two thousand inquiries every year about can we do this, can we do that. Um, the more you do, the more the more you're being inquired about, yeah, because everybody wants something. And I completely understand that we want to really honor every inquiry by writing back very nicely. Most often, of course, with a very nice no, because. I can only do so much. I have a limited budget that I have to fight for every year. But so if you see the company and it has a track record, it has artists that it worked with and it did so successfully. And um, you find out very, very quickly whether somebody just wants to jump from event to event or whether they really mean what it is that they're doing. And, um, and I'm, I'm actually, I feel very proud when, when artists are talking completely independently of us, you know, about, uh, oh, how was it to work with BMW? And they and they say it was great. You know, they did exactly what I wanted, and and they didn't do anything more. And they offered me things, and I could delve into them, or I couldn't in terms of know-how and knowledge and 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 network. Yeah. Yeah. You you often said also in other interviews that um, you don't. Well, you have to be brave also as a company, and you don't interfere so much with the artistic vision. How does that happen in practice? I mean, um, like you said, you need to be really clear from the very beginning uh, on expectations, but then how brave do you have to be as a company to, to give free reins to the artists? Well, I think also, you know, when we say that, that there's sometimes with the BMW art journey, for example, there's always, or the art car artists, for example, um, or, or many other things, there are always juries involved. Many companies are part of the jury. I always, I, I always say we are never part of the jury. And I always also want to make that very clear that we are not. 
because if anybody also chooses an artist, let's say who then is being caught with, I don't know, 10 prostitutes in a hotel room snorting cocaine, you know what I mean? These things happen. Um, and then people come running to us and say, how can you collaborate with this artist? I can always say, look, you never want companies to interfere. They, they were chosen not to put the blame on the jury, but they were chosen by a jury because we believe in the independence. So, you know, if I can only say that, you know, we are behind this format, we are behind the jury. If you want an opinion on the artist, speak to the members of the jury. You know what I mean? So it cannot also, it's good to have a jury that is really independent because to tell you the truth, it also creates a buffer between you and the artist. So we never collaborate with independent, with single artists. We mostly collaborate with cultural institutions. When we do, BMW Art Journey, Art Cars, and other things, um, create other initiatives, uh, um, then there's always a jury in place. And I think that's definitely the way to go. That's, that's one of these things um, where, you, um, uh, where you build up that trust that is important um, to, to move this ahead. Yeah, it's a good mechanism to, to have in place, definitely. And also, you know, the jury, when we talk about PR, when we talk about communications, look, if you have in the BMW art ju jury, art car jury, for example, you have great museum directors from the Guggenheim, from the Tate, from, uh, from we also always made sure have every continent be part of that, you know, have, um, have many museums and directors, a really diverse kind of jury to look into what artists to choose. Um, uh, uh, they of course they are part of that project then and if we if you if you may if you send out a press release and or if you if you um uh, um uh, if, if you delve into that network of those that chose an art car artist that is also great of course for for getting the word out because it's all of these institutions that somehow are linked to this project into this process and it's much better for a great museum director or chief curator to call up an artist and let them know uh, uh, that they won the BMW art journey or the BMW art car or that they were chosen as an artist than us, you know, um, because it's them that have the experience that are known in that world. And, and we are just happy to be part of that. Yeah. And I find it also really great because it strengthens multiple partnerships at the same time, not only between the company and the artist, but there are so many other actors involved. So it's a, it's an ecosystem, if you will, uh, rather than, only two two partners and look at if, if you look at the commercial side of, of things i mean if we, if we are partnering with the greatest art fairs on the planet the freezes in los angeles in london and new york the art basels in miami basel and hong kong of course paris photo uh, keotography and so forth um uh, and then those fairs have many partners you know and when we started with art basel for example ubs as a big partner in the great bank uh, Daffidoff, uh, easy jets and, and, and so they, they all had different events um, where we kind of um, separated and everybody threw their own things at the same time which kind of we cannibalized each other until we also when you say there's many involved when we thought hey UBS and, 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 and BMW they're not uh, 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 competing against each other you know on the contrary our clients could be great for them and the other way around so yeah. then we cost a lot of we, we cut a lot of costs and we do these things together um, and 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 it, it's it's so much more worthwhile for everybody involved because it's bigger it's better not that, that but bigger is necessarily better but you kind of create something there as well between um, those partners which I think has been a, a great learning for us yeah and collaboration overall I think it's it, it reaches new depths in in these years and uh and i think it's very important to see that we're not really alone as a player but but also um yeah connect with everyone um and do things together and talking about this and um sort of the future of businesses uh from your perspective what do you think the business leaders would have to tackle or what what are the biggest challenges that are to come or in, now in the present in in your opinion what actions should they take in terms of uh, in terms of collaborations with artists uh, or in general no not not only but as a general question that how what do you think that businesses face as challenges now i mean we've we've gone through this crisis now um it's yeah. been difficult in in different ways um there's been a lot of talk about 
how important it is to to have a human experience in in working contexts and and outside of the work and and maybe return to some of uh, of the values that then also link with sustainability and everything else. So I was just curious from your perspective now, today, um, what kind of challenges do you think businesses are presented with? And I think when it comes to when it comes to leadership and, and senior yeah. management, I think you've seen also in recent years a much bigger focus on soft skills, you know. But I also think that people from the humanities, you know, where you always think, oh my God, what jobs are they gonna have in the future if you're if, you're, if you just study arts and literature, I think it's great because, you know, I just saw recently that, that this is exactly, you know, what this, this ease of mind and being able to, you know, to have empathy, being able to, you know, have an abstract mind that can actually delve into the other in a dialectical sort of way um, is something that is actually cherished within companies. You know, that it's not just like this yeah. and that it's not just about the hierarchy and about being a strong leader and telling everybody exactly what to do, but really, no, understanding what the other person needs. Um, I think the only way to go forward as a leader is to have every single person that works for you intrinsically motivated, ideally, you know what I mean? And that is about giving them freedom to breathe instead of breathing down their necks. You know, that's one thing. Um, and that's true for everything, pretty much. And, and the rest is still dumb because you can't rule with fear. You know, people are not uh, uh, motivated by just fear. Um, so, so um, you know, look that everybody can work according to their skills, ideally, um, and that they retain that agility or that they keep that agility of mind that kind of sometimes, you know, uh, uh, turns into stone uh, uh, when you don't like what it is that you're doing. So I think, I think um, that, is, that is what leadership is about, you know, supporting your team, taking the blame, uh, 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 if, if, if somebody fails yourself, but also um, uh, and, 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 and spreading the joy and, and, and acknowledging, you know, the great achievement of others, uh, which is never yours alone. So um, uh, that is, that is, I think, important. Um, also, I think that the, the collaborations have become important. Everybody knows they can't go it alone. You know, I see this now, that whole culture, let's say BMW X, something you know it's always the x in between that actually makes these things strong and i think we've seen a shift in that because i remember when i started it at bmw and I, I i was responsible for the architectural communication for the amazing plant that zaha hadid had built um, in leipzig you know and zaha who passed away way too early but she left this planet a more beautiful place you know when, when she passed away in the new york times had this little that little film of all the images of the buildings that she created, you couldn't help but cry, even if you didn't know her, because you thought, my God, you know, there's this human being that built all these things together with her great team. And, and I was, you know, this is rewarding for my job to have worked together with Saha Hadid, who was not an easy person, but was just amazing, an amazing force. And so I learned so much from her and I'm eternally grateful for having made the experience of getting to know her so well. What I want to say is this, when this plant opened, and as proud as I am of BMW, having worked with amazing architects, which is just great. We have one of the greatest headquarters uh, on the planet. If you look at the Schwanzer four-cylinder building that was built about 50 years ago in Munich. Um, Zaha did, when that plant opened, the German chancellor was there, the one that no one remembers who came before Angela Merkel. No, he was, he was uh, <laughs> uh, Chancellor Schröder was there. Our CEO was there. Zaha Hadid was there. And, you know, of course, you know, many journalists were there. CNN was there. Why did CNN come? Not so much for, you know, as much as he was a great, great business leader for our CEO, not so much for as much as he was a great chancellor for Gerhard Schröder, but of course CNN was there for Zaha Hadid. And I remember that a lot of colleagues were saying, oh my God, there's this architect. She's now, you know, using our platform for her own visibility. <laughs> and I just always thought, isn't that the greatest thing? I mean, every story will mention that she built the BMW plant. You cannot not mention BMW if you talk about Zaha Hadid in Germany. So I think that has been understood, that this only makes us better and stronger. It's not about 
paying you know x amount of money for a brand ambassador that everybody can hire as a, as a hired gun to to sting your song but it is about these meaningful collaborations like with architects who really built your plant and so um i think that is the way forward and you see a lot more of that and i'm actually happy with our cultural initiatives to be leading the way in terms of what bmw is is uh, is is also doing in their core business wonderful Yes, it's very, very inspiring to hear uh, everything from your experience and also... Don't charm me too much. I'm, 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 I can Sorry. always easily be... Don't charm me too much. I can easily be flattered. And then <laughs> I blush. Well, I think you should be. It's, uh, it's really, really exciting work. Um, and well, on a, on a final note, I actually, you mentioned that you have a book coming out. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? You know, you mentioned at the very beginning that that I, that I teach, um, uh, you know, in, in Munich, in Zurich, in in Venice, in Madrid, uh, uh, cultural management, also art history and other things. But it's the cultural management. I've written a lot of books about um, art historical books, but I every time I teach, I see there's not a there there is not a book. I mean, not that people need. I I would argue. I mean, look at the back. I argue that people need books because we are all standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, we can delve into any of these in the back and a whole universe is open up to you. Why just not, why just be so self-involved with taking your selfie pictures for Instagram instead of just delving into a novel which teaches you not necessarily morals, which it doesn't have to, but empathy, you know? And, um, and, um, and so where was I? Oh, what I wanted to say is, right. And so I realize, no, but I believe in books. So I do write books because I believe they, they are there, they stand the test of time. And I don't say this because of immodesty on my part. I don't care as much about myself as I probably did care about myself 10 years ago. So I, I, I know that I know my function in life and I know what I can do and I know certainly what I cannot do, but I wanna open up rooms with my books. I'm the door in between. I'm not you know, the content that everything leads to. So I know my role. Um, and that happened with, with many of the books that I, um, that I wrote prior. But I realized teaching culture management, but that there is not such a book. So I am writing one for Thames and Hudson, great publisher that I also wrote my Duchamp dictionary for. They're in London and in New York. And it will be called, um, and thank you for letting me make that little pitch here, Alexandra. Sure, sure. Um, it's called Culture Management, a Global Guide. Because yes, opera is different from uh, is different from uh, from the fine arts. You know, literature is different from ballet. Um, certainly what opera means in China is different from what opera means in Africa and South and North America, uh, India and so forth. But nevertheless, there can be a meta level from which to fly into this whole subject matter of culture management. There's 40,000 people studying culture management around the world. There's millions employed in that profession, but there's no book. I mean, please, I mean, there are, you know, it's a whole science, but every time I'm getting interview requests, it's about, do you subscribe to this school or to that school? But it's really about doing it. You know what I mean? So my book is about doing it. And I, and I have great, I have eight contributions in that book from people around the world who are really specialists in that field. So um, I think that as general as this book is, it is for those in the field, as well as for those that want to delve into that field. So I, I, I you know, I wouldn't want to write it if it shouldn't become the standard book on that subject. And I think that, you know, many parents are probably let their children study cultural management because they think, oh, there's the word management in it. And they probably would be more reluctant if the, if the daughter wants to become an artist or the son wants to become an art historian. So I think, you know, although there are not that many jobs to be had and those that have great jobs, they sit on those jobs, you know, like me. That's why there's no, not so much of a fluctuation. I'm sorry to say. It's really, that is very bad and painful. And I understand I, I'm on the winning side of this, but, um, but cultural management is, I think, that is, is a profession that will be, um, uh, um, you know, now with the crisis, we have to see where this is going, but at the same time, that is meant to stay. So I think it's worth the effort um, to, to write about a subject matter that I've been deeply involved with for, you know, almost two, two decades now. Curious to read it. When is it coming out, actually? No, oh, God, I still got to write it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I so, okay. Know, it, 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 it'll come out. It'll come out sometime next year. Yeah. Right. 
Okay, great. Thank you so much. It, it's been really a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for making the time. And um, yeah, wish you all the best and exciting to see what you'll come up with next uh, with BMW culture engagement. Alexander, I want to throw that right back at you. I looked at what it is that co-founders does or what they're striving to do. I understand you're new with the company. I mean, thank you so much for reaching out to me and, um, and, and, and giving me the opportunity to speak because I also believe that it's important to pass on your knowledge to pass on what it is that you know, um, you know, if we really all understand that while ugliness is spreading around the world, nationalism, xenophobia, you know, um, pollution and all of these horrible things, we are working in the field of beauty. We can create something meaningful together and everybody plays their part in this. And, and I really believe in that. And, and that's where I think it's also important to, um, to, to, um, to pass our knowledge to some extent. Although, you know, it doesn't necessarily help artists because now with COVID and, and the pandemic, you see so many things going on on the internet, again, you know, for free because it's such a cost-free culture. It doesn't really give any artists money and means which they so much need because everything has come to a standstill. At the same time, you know, you see so many people pouring their hearts, their contents, their intelligence out into the internet for everybody to see, which is great. At the same time, it's very important, and I also say that as somebody who's been working in a company now, it's important to put the numbers behind this because it's not, you know, don't exploit yourself or, or be happy to work in a precariat, you know, where, where there's just no budget coming in. There must be, and it needs to be coming in because culture is what will remain um, um, on this planet when every business model has long uh, collapsed. And this is, this is what we do, and that's what we can do as humans on this planet to make our short life here um, of humankind on planet Earth into something worthwhile where we say, yes, we can also create that amazing concert, that amazing work of art. We can um, amidst all of that ugliness. So I see us also as, 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 you know, as, as being part of that very mission that turns us all into crew members on Spaceship Earth. Beautifully said. I, I also really believe in, in the power of culture and how it feeds us as humans and how it, yeah, it just makes us um, better uh, at understanding each other and understanding the world around us. Thank you so much once more. Thank, thanks to you. All the best. Same to you. Bye-bye. <laughs>